was a sensory attunement between horse and herder in Mongolia. Many working horses are subject to terrible pain, coercion and therefore domination. Tools such as whips and spurs are used on horses and at times individuals inflict unnecessary pain on the horse they are riding. But as I will describe here, most tools that are used as part of the mobile pastoral existence in Mongolia are not intended as agents of domination and subjugation, or even as a means of control. The human-horse relationship in the Mongolian southern Siberian montane steppe region is ancient, involving the gradual accumulation of interspecies knowledge and communication over thousands of years. Although bloodletting is an ancient Mongol healing tradition, there has been little documentation of the practice on horses, but will be described in detail below through a sensory ethnographic approach. David Anderson and a team of interdisciplinary researchers as part of the Arctic Domus project describe how tools and structures in the northern Arctic region are part of architectures of domestication, as they also have the capacity to facilitate communication between humans and other animals. Charles Stepanov writes of the cooperation between reindeer, reindeer and humans as a form of joint commitment rather than one of human-imposed control. Alex Ola also describes the use of material implements such as horses as new, nuanced communicative devices amongst the Soyot of southern Siberia. As he points out, the means of meaning of lassoes, ropes, tethering lines or shelters changes meaning for an individual horse over its lifetime and is aimed at forging mutual familiarity. I referred to modes of communication with the horse in agreement with Sara Schroer's use of communication as a term from the Latin communicare through the mutual creation of affinity and a sense of community between species. My use of the word attunement in the title is derived from Vincian Despre observation that domestication has affected bodies with, and I quote, practices that create and transform through the miracle of attunement. Tools could be thought of in certain contexts as creating possibilities for embodied communication and attunement between two separate species. Here I highlight the working utility of the bloodletting knife, or hatkur, as a means of building immunity and preventing illness. So bloodletting on horses. Bloodletting is a treatment involving the piercing or lancing of the skin at key points to encourage blood to flow from the body. Although the practice of bloodletting is now quite rare in most contexts due to the adoption of other forms of biomedical treatment, it is still an ongoing practice in many mobile pastoral cultures. Bloodletting is referred to within Mongolian texts as an ancient practice that is derived from nomadic pastoral techniques initially used to treat herd animals but subsequently practiced on humans across the Mongolian plateau. Contemporary Mongolia is one of the few places where bloodletting across species still occurs in the treatment of both humans and non-humans. Bloodletting tools between human and horse are not the same. The tools used on horses are often handmade and look more like a sample, simple blade encased in wood of varying lengths depending upon the condition, whereas Bloodletting tools on humans are finer. Objects such as knives are sacred, animate beings containing their own luck or hishig and are often passed down from father to son within families. Healers come from hereditary medical lineages so that a bloodletting practitioner has generally learnt the techniques from a parent or elder within the community. As male herders slaughter herd animals and dismember their parts, they build up knowledge about the underlying physiology and functioning of an animal's body, which can then be applied to humans too. According to the herders I interviewed, the flow of blood improves the horse's condition, accelerating recovery and the healing process. If too much blood is let, however, then the horse will lose strength, so the aim is to control how much blood is expelled by inserting the bloodletting knife at the correct point and at the right angle and depth. Gelsendorj, who will feature in the vignette to follow, described a particularly dangerous bloodletting point, Hulsenha, which is for injuries to the upper body from a rider being too heavy for the horse's back, 
resulting in swelling and internal injury. This kind of bloodletting requires a lot of experience and knowledge of the horse's physiology, as it requires inserting a long, narrow blade to the depth of four fingers in width. This is also dependent upon the size of the horse's chest. If the blade is pushed in at the wrong place, it could potentially puncture the heart, killing the horse. So a sensory and visual vignette, bloodletting. In April 2017, we stopped on our way to my usual field location to visit a herding family, as often occurs when on a journey anywhere in the countryside in Mongolia. This instance has become a particularly vivid sensory experience in my mind. I'm used to research in the mountain steppe region of the Hungai Mountains, but this was desert steppe and still early spring with hardly any grass for the herds to graze on. Vast sand dunes made for an unusual backdrop in the far distance. With a mobile phone, a neighbouring herder, Galsendorj, was called for assistance and in about 20 minutes a herder seemingly appeared on the horizon out of nowhere. He gradually moved towards us at a slow trot on horseback, reminiscent of a scene of, of a Bedouin on a camel slowly moving towards a well in the classic film Lawrence of Arabia. A cold wind was whipping across the steppe, making the dust rise in clouds as the horse herd, agitated and moving away from two teenage herders who were trying to lasso them with a leather lariat in a corral. They were reminiscent of risk-taking cowboys from a western, making the catching of the young horses and wrangling into a sport. The kinesthetic bodily engagement between Gelsendorj, as an experienced elder, and the two younger teenagers were markedly different. Roping the horses became like a rodeo performance for the young lads. The horses were behaving differently in the presence of the boys, the herd moving away in a swirling panic at being caught. Hitched to the side of the corral, a feisty stallion was determined to protect his herd. He pulled back on the tie and leapt over the corral, collapsing the top poles with a loud crash in the process. The neighbouring herder, Gelsendorj, observed that a young beige horse was already losing its winter coat and stumbling a few times as it moved across the stony ground. He pointed out the horse for one of the lads to catch. When one of the teenagers looped the lariat over this horse's neck, the beige horse didn't put up any resistance and stood still, possibly feeling too weak to resist after having just endured a long, hard Mongolian winter with little food. Prior to bloodletting, Gelsen George sat in the lee of the strong wind to the west side of the yurt or ger to sharpen his knife with a grindstone. While sharpening, he described four different kinds of bloodletting knife, as I recorded with a camera. He kept the knife he was sharpening for the specific purpose of bloodletting. In this instance, he planned to puncture specific blood vessels, vessel points on the lower inner foreleg or boot and at the back of the heel, Gahai. One of the herders teased him that he never described such details to him, jokingly accusing him of withholding knowledge. Are you not telling your secrets? You're way better than me, after herding for so long. Gosson Dorj replied mo modestly, How can I pe compete with you all? It was interesting that he was willing to pass on the knowledge verbally in front of a video camera, but had not voiced the different kinds of bloodletting to the teenager. He instructed the boys in what he required them to do to help out, and in that way they were learning through trial and error and cumulative experience. Galsendorj observed that the horse had what he called shading, a condition where the horse molts and loses its coat. It is from the horse eating the wrong kind of pasture, resulting in bad blood or an accumulation of blood in the legs resulting from toxins in the vegetation. He likens the horse stumbling and tripping to a person's hand becoming numb or going to sleep because the blood is not circulating around the body enough and not reaching the lower extremities. He explains that he lets blood from the heels so that the horse will no longer stumble as it walks. To redirect the pain that would, would be caused by insertion of the knife one of the boys twist, twists the horse's ear. This is also a technique used to control horses across many cultures, while the legs were immobilised by the use of leather hobbles. 
Galsandorj focused on letting blood out from the inner side of the lower forelegs as blood had accumulated there and at balanced points. He indicated the exact pressure point where the knife blade is placed, then punctured the skin with a quick jab and the horse jumped in response. Herders often assess the blood based on colour and viscosity, but they are familiar with the physiology of herd animals and what a healthy animal's blood looks like from slaughtering and skinning the pelts from individuals. If the blood is dark and viscous in colour, rather than pink and free-flowing, then it is considered bad blood. The blood itself becomes an active agent with good or bad aspects, free-flowing or slow or, and viscous, pink or a dark, almost black colour. Gelsendorj explained that the flow of blood around the horse's body had become irregular. To counter this, the herder massaged up the horse's forelegs to push the blood up from the hooves, also encouraging the blood to flow out of the body. The herder's hands inadvertently became covered in the horse's blood. Ordinarily, herding families are, family members are careful not to spill any blood out of respect for the animal, because blood and bones are viewed as sacred. In this case, however, it is acceptable to allow blood to be released and to spill freely on the ground in order to expel the bad blood out of the body. Once the blood was flowing better and less viscous, the young beige horse was released. He shook himself and walked over the, to the corral to be with the rest of the horse herd. He didn't attempt to move away rapidly from the humans, evidently aware that his ordeal was over. The horse looked tired and weak and a little stunned by the procedure. One of the teenagers announced, Beige horse is getting his legs back. Gelsendorj explained, I will not catch him or ride him for one month. After a month, he will return to his usual horse self. He will look well and gain fat easily. As for herders, a healthy animal is one that contains enough fat. When Gelsendorj had finished his task, he stepped up on his horse, turned without a word, and cantered back into the surrounding desert steppe in the opposite direction from whence he had come. So to conclude, the tools used on horses can potentially be used as a means of control and coercion. Yet they can also be thought of as a part of the architectures of domestication, whereby tools are part of an important means of embodied communication with an animal as strong and potentially willful as a free-roaming Mongol horse. Bloodletting is part of an embodied sensory engagement between herder and horse. The herder feels for the correct point on the horse's body with his fingers before using a knife to jab into the horse's body and then may help the blood to flow better by applying massage or if flowing too freely will actively block the flow of blood with his hand in a cloth. Bloodletting is representative of the herder's approach to medicinal treatment more generally. The prevention is better than the necessity for curative measures further down the track. Bloodletting is often used, therefore, prior to a horse becoming sick. If a herder observes that the, a horse's coat looks dull or the horse is not molting at the right time of year, then the herder will bleed the horse to kickstart the horse's immune system. The horse is then observed as becoming more energetic, healthier and fatter. When I've shown the footage of herders with herd animals, there has been the occasional reaction that the herder is using excessive force. Or with filming footage of bloodletting, the person becomes squeamish and covers their eyes to avoid seeing the spurting blood. Yet being familiar with the context, I'm aware that the herd animals know the individual herd as well and that the horse is not as fearful of the situation as may be perceived from the outside. Horses can gauge human intention and social cues well, and are likely to be able to interpret that the herd is not trying to harm them unduly. Bloodletting does require the individual horse to be hobbled to avoid being kicked, or an ear twisted to re redirect the fo focus away from the jabs to the body. But the herder's intention, however, is to assist the individual horse's health and prevention of future illness and is not meant as a means of forceful submission and subservience from the horse. Mm -hmm.